thank you, Lord, Yeshua, the only name above every other name is the name above corruption, is the name above disease, sickness, disease, depression, anxiety. Jesus is the name above debt, poverty, anything you can imagine. He is the name above it all. He owns everything. He runs everything. And we thank you, Lord, that this moment right here, Lord, we want to fully surrender everything to you, Lord. Lord, we're sorry if we've become lukewarm, if we've become distant from your presence. Lord, we're sorry if we haven't obeyed your will, your, your word for us, your plan for us, Lord. I just feel some of us ladies have felt some regret for things that the Lord has told you to do and you haven't obeyed or maybe you've been hesitant to. If I've taken the wrong turn, if I've been places where I shouldn't have been, if I've made the wrong business decisions, if I've been aligned to the wrong people, Lord, I ask you right now that you realign me to where you need me to be. Maybe you did something in the flesh. You bought something in the flesh. You, you did something in the flesh. And you're saying, Lord, forgive me for doing things according to my own way, how I wanted it to be. But today I want what you want for me. What is your will for me? What is your plan for me, for my life, my marriage, my children? Lord, right now we want to realign ourselves to your presence again. Whether we've been distanced from our uh, churches, distanced from our family, distanced from wherever it might be, Lord, we ask you that you realign right now in the spirit. And we ask you, Lord, that you're putting everything in order, everything that was distracted in chaos. Right now, we ask you, Lord, for perfect order once again. Whether the enemy has come and tried to steal your joy, we ask you, Lord, that you return that joy that's been stolen, that joy that the enemy has come and ripped from you. We ask you, Lord, that right now in this moment that you will return double-fold those years of joy that has been done and what you've started to do. And those who couldn't be here this morning, we thank you, Lord, that as they watch this later on, that they'll experience the same power, the anointing, and the revelation that is going to come forth. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. You may be seated in the meantime or on the floor. You can stay down, girl. Go for it. <laughs> Sometimes it's easier just to stay down. And we can have the lights and the piano just a little bit softer. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Awesome. Well, I have a, just a good word for you this morning. So last week, Sunday night, um, we had an awesome anointing service. And I kept on hearing this phrase, um, don't put down your sword. Don't put down your sword. And I was like, yo, what does that mean? Don't put down your sword. So obviously we, we know Ephesians and we've all gone through the, um, the armor of God and what, what, what. But I want to just focus on the sword a little bit this morning. So what is the biblical meaning of a sword? So Ephesians 6, 13, the sixth piece of the armor that Paul discusses in Ephesians 6 is the sword of the spirit, which represents the word. Oh, you guys read your Bibles. Praise God. Okay. It represents the word of God. For a Roman soldier, the sword served as an offensive weapon against his enemy. When sharpened, the sword could pierce through about anything, making it a very dangerous tool. Now, how many ladies have cut yourself cutting carrots or something? That's just a little knife, and you can chop off your whole finger. But an, a sword is this massive piece of equipment that was designed to come against the enemy. Now, that is in the natural, and the Bible refers to the sword but as the same thing as your Bible. So can I borrow someone's Bible quickly? Liesl, you got a Bible there. Let me just steal your Bible quickly. So this, oh, this Bible's been used, praise God, okay? If your Bibles look like this, that means it's a good thing. If you have to, every time then there's a problem with your Bible and you're reading, okay? But your Bible is a sword, is a word. The word of God is your sword, is your weapon. So when the enemy comes, you should be able to attack him with the word. Attack him with the word. And then also it's a defense. Like if you saw in the flyer, it was Wonder Woman, she was doing this with her sword. So the sword also is a defense. Now, I don't know which Marvel movie it is. Maybe the boys will tell me. Um, there was one Marvel scene where the guy stopped a bullet with his sword. So he just like put it, I don't know, bullets, a ra laser, razor, whatever what happens in Marvel. But he literally lifted up his sword. And in that little piece of sword, he managed to stop a bullet. And I thought about that in the sense of our word when the enemy comes, when he comes to tell you your diagnosis, 
you know, there's a possibility you've got this sickness or dementia kicks in or the boss is calling on retrenchment or, or, or whatever, or depression or whatever you might be going through. Are you lifting up your sword to fight against that diagnosis? Because it's the word of God. So when the enemy says, just for illustration purposes, Marzan, that um, you are a loser, you're not going to be capable of anything, you're not going to be able to move in the kingdom of God, you're just going to sit there because you're a woman, you must be barefoot and pregnant for the rest of your life. That's your plan, okay? But the Word of God does not say that about Marzan. The Word of God says she's more capable of that, that she's called, she's chosen, she's a Proverbs 31 woman. So what does she do when the enemy comes? She fights it with the Word. However you want to fight with your Bible. So you counteract the enemy's thoughts and his desire for you with the Word of God. So before you go to your pastor or before you go to a therapist, a counselor, your boss, whatever it might be, what does the Word of God say about you, first of all? Because he says he wants you to have life and life in a what? Sorry, say that again. Abundance, not a little bit. That you only have joy a little bit or every now and again. In abundance. And women, like, and I say this at every women's conference, and we'll say it for the next 30 years, before, or 80 years, 90 years before we go home to be with the Lord, that our emotions are a problem, okay? So when we get a diagnosis or when we get bad news, when we start worrying about that kid, what do we do? We go into what mode? Panic mode. I'm a bad mother, I'm a bad wife, I'm a bad pastor, I'm a bad churchgoer, I'm a bad Christian. And we go all through, and our emotions kick in. And even Pastor Chantal, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, so she was telling me, oh, it was a, it was a pure flesh emotional moment, which we all go through all the time. And she was bawling her eyes at me, and she's telling me about what the situation was. And she's like, I can't believe, and I'm just, I'm concerned, and I'm worried. This was a while ago. And I looked at her, and she's like, like, she's waiting for me to be like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, he did what, no. And I sat there, and I almost was smiling at her. And she was like, okay, now I'm getting a little bit annoyed with you because you're smiling at my situation. And I said, Chantel, you are talking to me in the flesh and not in the spirit. You are reacting in your emotion and not in your, in your spiritual, your walk, who you are as a child of God. You're reacting in emotion right now. And she even said to me, she's like, have you become a lot harder? I'm like, no, no, no. I've just become a lot more spiritual in the sense of where I don't let situations affect me as much as they used to before. Do you know what I mean? So now when you get bad news, 20 years ago, you'd freak out, or five years ago, you go into panic mode. We'd first of all say, what does the Lord say? What does the Bible say about the situation? Before I worry, even especially as a pastor, five, six years ago, when someone leaves the church or something happens, <gasps> panic mode, I was in, can I just share my testimony for a lady, for ladies here and those who are watching online? When was this? About two years ago, babe? Two years ago, when COVID, just before COVID hit, must have been, yeah, January 2020, I would have, it felt like an elephant sitting on my chest. Who has those moments? And I'd be like, <sighs> And then I couldn't, like, I'm thinking, yo, my lungs are not capacitating like they should be capacitating, you know? And I'm thinking something's wrong. And to the point where I would have to get up from the side of my bed and, you know, having to, okay, just think, you know, that breathe in, breathe out, breathe double in, okay? And I'm thinking, yes, this is weird, you know? And it was going on for a while. And what bothered me, it was hitting me in the middle of me watching my series. So when I'm at the most calm. I'm not doing work, I'm not answering emails, I'm not dealing with members, and I'm feeling this, and I'm like, something's not right. So I'm thinking now, by the time I went, COVID was already on the scene, so I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's a COVID thing, maybe it's a lung thing, maybe it's pneumonia, maybe my lungs collapse, I don't know. So I go to the doctor, and I'm explaining to him, and he's asking all these questions, I'm like, oh, these questions don't really sound very medical. They're going a little bit to the other side now, where you're asking are you stressed? And I'm like, what does it have to do with my lungs, you know? And he's asking me, um, are you any, are you like under stress? I'm like, listen, brother, I run a church. Stress comes with the package. It's part of, you know, you get benefits in your job. The one of our benefits is stress, you know, betrayal every day, 24-7. And, you know, you get paid out with anyway, but that's for another conference, okay? So I said, well, this is what we do. I mean, this is our life. We, we, we lead people. We see a lot of people that are struggling. We see... Um, you know, a lot of people go through things, and we take it on ourselves, obviously. And he's busy typing on his computer. 
And he's like, and we have a very close relationship with our doctor. He's like a friend of ours. And he looks at me and he's like, my girl, and he's never called me my girl before. He's like, I think I'm going to give you a diagnosis. I'm like, okay, cool. Hey, antibiotics, we'll knock this out. He's like, no, you are showing all the signs of anxiety attacks and anxiety. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. uh, Dr. Manga, I am, according to, I am a child of God. I, I am a pastor. I can't be having anxiety. I'm a pastor. I mean, I preach against this demon and now I'm the one that has it. He's like, no, no, no. And I said, but my husband also has similar symptoms. And or at that time, we were both feeling, you know. But he said, for me specifically, I'm going to give you, a, I think it was called a Category 5 depression, tablet, anxiety thing, what, what, what. So I had to take it. And he said, these are the side effects. And you have to be on this, what, what, what. And I phoned my husband on my way home in the car. And I said, listen to me now, babe. I do not accept this diagnosis. I'm telling you now, I will not accept it. She's like, no, we're going to pray and we're going to come. I'm like, no, no, I'm telling you, I will not. And we went home. I remember we went to Fahrenheit for, for breakfast, lunch afterwards, because now, you know, when you're stressed, you eat. So we went and we ate. And I said to him, we can't do this. So in our flesh, we're trying to think, okay, how do we slow things down a little bit? How do we relieve the stress off of me a little bit? Um, but I said, you know what, regardless, I'm not doing this. So, but still, I obeyed my doctor. And I went and I got the prescription. And I went and I Googled it. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, this is not me. This is not, I should not be on this stuff. This is talking about people to go on this stuff for extreme anxiety, depression, uh, suicide. I'm like, this is not the stuff I want to be on. So I was on it for two weeks. I had a prescription for a month. I was on it for two weeks. I did not like how I felt on them. I didn't feel like I could feel God. I felt, didn't feel right. And I said, I am done. I took the whole prescription and I threw it in the bin. And I said, I refuse because the Bible says life, life in abundance, joy, peace is my portion. So I took a, I made a proactive decision to not accept it on myself. I went into the word. Nowhere does it say that I have to have anxiety because the Bible says cast your cares. So I said, every care that I have, every anxiety that I have, I cast it on the Father. I chucked those pills. It's been three years, never had to go on them again. It's the sword. Can I use the sword a bit more? Do you need it? Okay, because I like the sword. It feels used. It feels sharpened. It feels like someone's been sharpening it. So I took what was in the Bible, and I applied it in my situation, and I used it as a sword. So when the enemy came at me with depression or or anxiety, stress, I used the sword to combat what he was saying, to combat that diagnosis, and I've never, ever struggled. And there were times, I'm not saying it gets easy, because there are times it does try and creep back, and you're having that moment where you, and you're like, Pastor Rosie, stop it now, you're also breathing heavily now. <laughs> but when you're having that moment again, you're feeling like, wait a minute, are you trying to come back? Oh, no, I don't think so. Because we dealt with this three years ago, and you've already been cast down. You've already not allowed back into my home because my home is an anxiety-free, depression-free zone. You can go to the neighbor next door. He looks a little bit sad, so he's not safe. But don't come to my house. This is my house, and I will not have that in my place. It's a stress-free zone. That's how when we come home, it's my place. That's how we always tell people, careful who you let into your home. Careful what atmospheres you let into your home. Because when you leave in a spirit to hang around there, and if you are not sharpening your sword in prayer, worship, reading your Bible, coming to church, because it's all of this is sharpening your sword. So even when you come into church, we are sitting here, okay, other side, we are sharpening your sword. So when you go out into the world, into your workplace, into your families, you've already got your sharp pre- your sword pre-sharpened at church already. That's the point of the church, the sword, that's what it is. So let's continue. So we all know if uh, Hebrews 4.12 you don't have to put it up. You can, I know I didn't give past. The, oh, look at Philip, my brother. You shop. F- if, uh, Hebrews 4.12. Let's go there. Well, we've got each other. For the word of God is what? Is what? Is living. So we're not serving Buddha who's dead long time ago. That guy is gone, okay? The Bible is alive. If you can actually... Look at it and say, it is living. So 
Obviously, I'm sure you guys have those family members or your friends. Don't look at me. Don't, you know. That say that that was written for back then. It doesn't apply for now. And when the Bible said, I mean, we know people that said, you know the Isaiah that says, by his stripes you were healed? Oh, don't we love that scripture? We declare it, you healed. We have people that say, no, that scripture was for back then. It doesn't apply for now. And I'm like, no, I need that to apply for now because it still applies for now. Because it's what? It's still living and powerful and sharper than two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit. So now it's between the the spiritual realm and joint and marrow, even the natural realm. So even when you have your soul, there also is a level of protection, even in the natural. When you've got your armor on, there's protection. There's the armor of God. It's not just there for the spiritual, it's there for protection as well. Cut in between soul and spirit before joint and marrow. It exposes, oh, the sword, yeah, that's another part of the sword, guys. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. So if you want, if you like, ladies, I want my sword. Pastor Nats, I, you know what, I want to fight against this demon. I'm going to have the sword. Okay, the sword also will expose. So if you say now, I want to come against the sickness in my, in my heart, in, in, my, in my body. That sickness could be there from a result of an open door, dare I say. Don't shoot the messenger, guys. Okay. So what will happen is the sword will come and say, okay, that sickness is a result of this door that you opened three years ago. If you don't deal with this door, the sword is going to have no effect. You, know, you can might as well get those little plastic swords that those kids play with. Ding, ding. There's no effect. So even when the sword is coming into perspective, coming into natural now, you need to go now and say, okay, but if this is where the result came in, I need to now deal with that area of my life. And the sword will now cut it away. So I have this game on my iPad. Yes, I do play games, okay? It's not like Call of Duty or anything. It's like Candy Crush. That says I'm a, I'm a serious gamer with Candy Crush. But I downloaded a, a game. Now, I love uh, medical dramas, the Grey's Anatomies, and I love those stuff because I learn so much. If I watched that stuff when I was a teenager, I would probably be a doctor today, literally. That just didn't cut people and things like that. But anyway, so I downloaded this game. It's a medical surgery game. So in this game, you are the doctor, and you get to do the surgeries, and I love it. I'm sitting there, and I'm cutting cancer away. I'm like, yo, I'm healing people. I'm putting stitches on, and I feel like Grey's Anatomy, you know. And I'm remembering this one part of the thing where there was a cancer in in the game, and it was like a ball. And in order to remove it, and they give you instructions, you have to cut the cancer out of the person. So I had to trace the line with the scalpel around, and I had to make sure I got everything. Because if you notice, if, and if you're anyone who knows cancer, if you leave a little bit behind, it grows again. So I had to make sure I go around, and like I'm very shaky with little things. So I'm saying like, mm, come on, get the cancer, get the cancer. So I got the whole cancer out that I thought of. And then the next thing was, the doctor in the game sends the thing and says, you didn't remove the whole cancer. The cancer's going to start growing again. So the sword has to now, you have to cut out everything that's not supposed to be there. And that process is sore. You have to go through recovery. You have to be opened up. You have to remove it. You're going to bleed. You have to be on blood thinners. And God knows what else you have to be. But it's a process that the sword is a part of. It's to cut things out of your life that is not supposed to even be there. Does that make sense? So now it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. And just to share a couple of years ago, um, how many of you have ever prayed for healing? You've received your healing and your words then got rid of the healing? In In the sense of you lost your healing? Have you ever heard of people like that, that, You get your healing, and then you spoke something, and then you lost your healing. Okay, so what happened to me is, talking about the sword now, I was like, I'm done. You know, I want to get healed. So for those of you who don't know, I've only got 70% hearing in my left ear. So if you ever talk to me, talk on this ear, okay, so I can hear you properly. You can yell at me, but then anyway. So a couple of years ago, before we were even married, Pastor Al, we were doing, I think we were at a school doing a healing, a healing thing. And Pastor, I was like, someone, sh- uh, God has shown me that there's someone in their left ear that battles with hearing. And I was like, you know what? Today's my day. I'm going to claim 
my healing in my left ear, and I'm going to be free. And I literally felt it pop open. I was like, oh, wow, I think sound louder now. Praise God, I can hear. And that night when I went to bed, I was in this routine where if, if there's any noise or anything, I would sleep on this ear because then it blocks out some of the sound. And that happened to be the night where the neighbors were doing a party. And I'm getting so annoyed. I'm like, yes, oh, you know, oh. And then I had the, and I said it out loud. I'm like, yes, before I got my healing, I would be able to just, you know, and I wouldn't be able to hear. Now I can hear these guys nice and loud, and now I can't sleep, you know. But praise God, I'm healed, you know. The next night, I noticed my healing was gone. Because the minute I turned around, I felt it, and it's still like that today. Because I do want to be healed. I am healed in Jesus' name, but at the same, anyway. But you, these are things you have to deal with, with the sword. That are you willing to deal with it completely? Or when you speak, because your words carry power. So when you get your healing, when you get your deliverance, what are you speaking that's counteracting it? That's why we say when it comes to deliverance, if someone wants to get delivered and set free, what's the number one rule after that? You have to be in church and be in part of a ministry that's going to support you and help you. Because the minute you're done with your deliverance and you walk away, you've lost your deliverance. It comes back seven times worse, which is why, the, I mean, the number one question I get asked often as a church, do we do deliverance? I'm like, yes, we love deliverance. We do it all the time. Okay, what's the protocol? Once you've done done been delivered, are you in church? No, I'm just hoping that I'll get delivered and I'll sort myself out at home. Then I'm like, can't do it. Sorry, we can't do deliverance on you if you don't want to be here. I had a mom at the women's conference last year. She came to me and she says, her daughter severely possessed, I mean like being thrown off the bed and like fully chucky type of stuff going on with this girl. And she says she wants to get delivered. So I'm like, praise God. She's like, no, she's, she's not in a church. So I said, okay, well, is she willing to join? If she wants to join, since she's just down the road, we are willing to help her, you know, walk the process. Like, no, 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 she hates the church. She doesn't believe in church, doesn't believe in the body of God, doesn't believe it's just funerals and weddings and that's it. So I said to her, well, um, then there's no point in doing deliverance. You know, this mom got so angry with me, sitting at the back there, got so angry. I mean, I literally saw her face go red. You won't do deliverance on my child? I'm like, no, because it's going to get seven times worse even if we do. So I'd rather have your daughter in this state than when the sword does fall, then she's going to be even worse. Then you're really going to come crying to me. So we can't do that. So the sword exposes your innermost thoughts and desires. So even the sword will reveal if you actually really want to be healed. Like some people, they are happy with their sickness or their disease or they become complacent. Oh, it's just a little bit of diabetes. You know, I can survive with diabetes. It's just a little bit of anxiety. It's just a little bit. So why will God heal you? It's the same thing with my ear. Why would he heal me, heal me if I've become complacent with it? Now, that's me talking to myself here. But if you really want to be set free in certain areas, how serious are you to cut that cancer out of your life? Whether it's physical or natural, are you ready to cut it out? Because it is going to hurt. Nothing in creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes, and He is the one in whom we are held accountable. So the part there where it says everything in creation is not is hid, is nothing is hidden. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes. And every time I read the scripture, I'm remembering a friend of mine that I had in high school. And um, such a sweet boy. But uh, anyway, he was going through the process of becoming a Christian and coming to church and what, what, what. And he shared that the one time before he really got fully born again, in between the phase, he was on his computer. And we know what young boys do on the computer. And because he was raised Catholic, he still had a Jesus Catholic statue on his by his computer, and he said before he clicked on the link that he was going to click on to do what he's going to do, he turned Jesus around because there was this impression that Jesus was watching me through the statue. What are you doing, you know? So, we, so he turned Jesus around and continued to do what he was doing, and then when he's done, you know, you turn Jesus back around again, you know, when you do your homework. It doesn't work that way. Everything is before God, and that is why even the Bible talks about discernments. And I was going to play a video, but I'll just share about discernment because the sword also has to come with discernment. That's why people don't like sent ones. I'm going to put it out there right now because nothing stays hidden very long. Not that we're trying to investigate you and we've got a team of FBI. It's in the spirit eventually comes out. So the Bible says what is in your heart will eventually 
come out of your mouth. So we can just be sitting here, have a normal church service, nothing's happening. But because something's happening here, and because Holy Ghost is allowed here, eventually, poof, it's going to happen eventually. Then the church looks like bad, like weak. No, you expose yourself because we believe nothing is hidden. So people have this opinion where when I jump from church to church to church to church, I can hide. No, 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 no. Eventually when you come to us, you can either deal with it and say, okay, it's out now in the open, and I want to deal with it so I can be free, so I can move on, or I can run to the next church and hide and hide and hide and hide, which is not because nothing's hidden. God's watching you like, I can see what you're doing. So even when you're at church and you're alone here in, in worship, you can be raising your hand. So to all of us, we're looking like, oh, wow, Marzan's touching the face of the Lord as we speak Look at those tears coming down her eyes. She's encountering the presence of God. Meanwhile, she's crying because that KFC hit so nice the night before. But to us, you think she's encountering God. But to God, God sees like, okay, you're playing a fool here a little bit. You, you, you're not really worshiping me. So as a church, you're thinking she's encountering God. But nothing is hidden from God, especially your heart. He sees it. He sees it. Like you can be in church, St. Juan's members, you know, I'm not attacking you, but you could be here one morning and Pastor I'll give such a good word. But in between there's a little bit of, but it's still such a good word and there's jokes in between. You love it. As soon as you walk out into your car and you say something negative, you immediately lost everything that happened here and God heard what you said. Then you wonder why offense creeps in. I don't like Pastor Al anymore. He's got a weird hairstyle. Have you seen his young wife? And you wonder where all of that comes from. Babe, we love your hair, by the way. You look like a gangster. We love it, okay? Didn't he look like a real soccer player? At, when you, if you saw those pictures, he looked like he could play for Brazil. You know what I mean? But he can, in Jesus' name. I told him he must coach the kids one day with soccer because the guys are rolling too much and playing. He knew soccer when it was supposed to be back then, you know? So you get stabbed in the foot, you still play, you know? Here you get... You get slapped in the air and you roll, 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 roll for hours, okay? Anyway, back to the Word of God. So, so what happens is the Lord hears your heart and what you speak. So even to us, and as, we've experienced this thousands of times, Pastor Natalie, I love you and I love this church. And the Lord, I'm just so blessed to be a part of this ministry and just what the Lord is doing here. And I just feel, I just feel His presence. And you're like, you got a bit of snotty over there, sister. You can say that to me, but then in the car, you know what? I just don't know why such a young person is running a church. You know, I love Pastor Nat, but is she really even qualified? And she, did she, I mean, you know, she dropped out of first year Bible school. What does she know? God saw that. So now God is sitting there like, what did you just say now? And you even, even did a fake snort everything. And then in the car, you said something different. And then God is saying, okay, because that your heart is divided, it is exposed because I might not see that. So to me, I'm thinking, oh, they really love the church and God's touching their life. Praise God. It's all worth what I'm, you know, what we're doing here. And our pastors, we feel this way. Praise God. And then we wonder why three months later, that same person is manifesting now, freaking out, causing trouble, causing offense, pulling their kid out of children's church, or something's happening. And in your heart, you're like, but we were good like three weeks ago. Everything was good. What happened? You spoke. You said something, in, whether it was even in your heart. The Lord heard what you said. And immediately, that's why you can sit in church and you receive nothing. Then Marzan genuinely is next to you. And you could be in the middle of Marzan and Pastor Chantal. And they are, I mean, the glory of God is hitting them. Pastor Chantal gets flown three chairs back. And Marzan's in tears. And we're having to give her all the, And you're sitting there like in between. And you're saying, I don't feel anything. Why am I not feeling anything? It's because what's in the heart. You automatically close yourself off. You don't even know you close yourself off from the presence of God. So the Holy Spirit's moving. Yes, receive. Mm. Yes, receive. Mm. So even in church, that's why the church gets blamed for a lot of things. I don't feel God in that church. I don't feel love in that church. Well, if you actually know Him, you could feel Him anywhere. You can be in the middle of spa in the chicken aisle, and God can clap you in the aisle there because you experience him wherever he goes. So we were in a church a couple of years ago. I mean, frack, dead. No, I don't even know if that's the right word. I mean, dead. 
there's nothing happening there. The poor, the poor worship team's like, come on, guys, worship. And, you know, you know it's bad when the poor pastor, the, the worship leader is trying to get the people to praise and worship, and they just like, but even in their service, me and Pastor, we're encountering God. We're like, wow, we're feeling God, and he's, he's moving. And Because it wasn't what was happening in the church, it was what was happening with us. So you can carry the church with you and God with you everywhere you go. If you have that mentality, the church will never be a cause of offense for you because it's not about the church. It's important to be here. But what happens here, you need to remember, there are broken people here as well. The church never hurt you. Broken people did. If you have that mentality that it's not the church, the church, no, it was people that hurt you. People are, if you have grace for me, that I'm also human, I also put my pants on one leg at a time. There's nothing supernatural about it. I don't have angels serving me coffee in the morning. I also have my moments. PMS also hits once a month. Um, I also back away from people because your murder instincts kick in once a month. But I have, must be honest, it's been getting a lot better over the years. Remember my early days, it was bad. They would stay clear for me for a whole day. Where Pastor Al has always said, I've always been so well behaved. Even, why are you putting your head down? I've never had murderous in- <laughs> instinct, nothing. So I believe the closer you get to the Lord, he removes those instincts to kill, okay? But all it is, is the closer you get to the Lord, these things start to get removed from you. And then also you start to, I, what I do is when I feel your body has hormones, and I could feel there's an anger in me, the dog did something wrong, something happened, and you could feel there's an excuse now for PMS to kick in, I actually will stop myself, I'll be like, Lord, please help me, so I don't affect my marriage or the dog, I don't kick the the neighbor, I'm just calm, and I actually could feel myself starting to calm down. When I make that decision, okay, now I've recognized that it's that time of the month, thank you, Lord, for hormones, thank you, Lord, that everything's running smoothly as it should but let me just be calm in this moment. So as women, before you react to anything, take a second before you talk. I know it's difficult, but just take a break. Take a breath. Just take one breath, and God will do the rest. Amen? So again, it's alive, and it's, it, nothing is naked and exposed before his eyes. So if we desire the sword, the sword will expose. So if you're like, Lord, drop the sword in my family. Yeah, you must be careful when you pray that. Because that's when everyone's going to start manifesting now. And then the mother-in-law is tuning you this, and the dog's mother-in-law is doing this. And then it's like chaos. But you wanted the sword. Because if we talk about a sword again, when is the next portion of Scripture where the sword is spoken? Where Jesus says, I'm coming to bring a sword. But if you, if you actually read further, between mother and daughter, between mother-in-law and son-in-law, between family, there's a distinction between the sword. Not that Jesus is going to come and make sure everyone has chaos, but he wants to see the distinction even in your family. So the sword will fall. And when it does fall, you might lose some family members. See, the Bible didn't say there that it's okay to stay in a bloodline of abuse because it's family. So because it's family, they can walk on you. You have to provide for them, even though they're married and got their own lives or whatever. That's when the sword starts to fall. Because the sword is going to distinguish who is from me and who is not from me. Then they continue to say, if you love your daughter more than me, you are not worthy of me. If you love your husband more than me, you are not worthy of me. That's where the distinction comes in. The sword. So be careful. Lord, drop the sword in my family. That mother-in-law, we cost the sword. Be careful. When the sword falls, you're going to come crying. Because it's going to expose everything. Bloodline curses will come out. Then everything starts to make sense. Why is there such adultery in the bloodline, in the family? Because when the sword comes, these things will start to get exposed. Oh, so that's why there's a pornography in my family. Because a hundred years ago, I had an uncle who was in an adulterous relationship who had pornography, who had lust. And if we don't deal with that, when the sword does come, all of that family stuff comes out of the woodwork. Then you can create your own reality show of all the drama. So be careful with what you deal with. But family is not an excuse to allow abuse to continue. Because that's when you ask for the sword to come. And when the sword comes, he's saying, do you love that person more than me? Do you love? We had a family many years ago that the family dynamics were so toxic 
so toxic and I can't go into details for reasons, but extreme, I mean, you are allowed to leave that family. Please, by all means, take your kids and run. And Pastor Al sat with her a while ago and said, can you honestly tell me that you love God more than your family? And she said, no, I love the family more. And you can see they're not here today because the sword fell and she made a decision which side of the sword she was going to be on. And now life is horrible for them. It's really quite sad. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one in whom we are accountable. So Ephesians 6.17 calls the word of God the sword of the spirit. And Apostle Paul urges believers to use it to fight against spiritual attack, sickness, disease, against your family, against your spiritual walk. Like even if you notice, have you noticed the more you get closer to God, it feels like more stuff comes against you? Then like when you first, let's be honest, when you first got born again, you were excited to come to church. You're like, yay, I'm excited. But as the years go, the passion starts to die. And that's what starts to happen. You're supposed to be getting more on fire. It's like the same thing with marriages. My love for my husband, I know it's only been seven years, but I love him more every day than what I did the day before or the year before. The same thing how it should be with the Lord. You should be falling more in love with him. And if you're not falling more in love with him, you are backslidden. Sorry. It's true. Because if I don't fall more in love with my husband, a divorce will happen one day if I'm not more in love with him every day. Because what happens is we become complacent with each other and your love starts to fade where you should be coming more in love. Like all these guys that are 40 years married. Wow. More in love every day. There's a song from Backstreet Boys and I hear they come into South Africa and it says, they sing the song, I want to grow old with you. I want to die lying in your arms. I'm like, yeah. And Valentine's Day, I dedicated it to my husband on TikTok. I don't know if you saw it, but anyway, it was very romantic. (laughs) Because it says, I want to grow old with you. I want to die lying in your arms. I mean, that is beautiful. Can you imagine in your ripe old age of 95, you with your husband still madly in love with each other, enjoying each other, still doing the stuff that married people can do, just because you're old. Come, guys. You can still do it, okay? Look at Abraham, right? And can you imagine you have your last cup of coffee? I'm not saying don't go falling pregnant on me now, ladies, okay? If it's, it should be entertainment system for now, okay? Until you go be home with the Lord. But can you imagine 95 years old, you're having a cup of coffee with your husband, You've said goodbye to your great-grandchildren. You're like, okay, are we ready? We go, we lie in bed. We say, Lord, we out of here. Gone. Pull a whole Elijah on you. Your kids can't find your body. Make them get nervous. I'm joking. But can you imagine? That's how it should be. And that is how it should be with the Lord. You see these old couples bickering with each other, fighting. You still haven't taken out the trash. It's been 20 years, you know. It's going on and on and on where your relationship, that's why God looks to marriage as the same relationship with him. That's why I come to the marriage seminar for more information. But the more you love your spouse, you get to know your spouse every day. Like I still learn new things about my husband every day. He surprises me every day. Some of them aren't good surprises, but I'm so happy about the surprise either way. <laughs> but every day I learn something new. If, you know, it's been seven, I know it's only going on seven years marriage, but seven years we still hold each other's hands when we watch TV. I know, right? And when it's summer and it's too hot, we at least got our feet touching like that. You know, so the connection's always there. But some Christians, we can't even do that with the Lord. When things get difficult, you barely even come, Lord, can we just touch toes just so at least we connect it? God doesn't want that. He wants all of us. He wants to embrace you all the time. And if you feel like your walk with God is becoming a little bit just toe touching and that's it, God, I'll just, there we go, that's just touching toes. God doesn't want that. He wants everything. He wants everything from you. Amen? Come for the marriage seminar for more exciting stuff. Okay. So... Hebrews 4.12 reminds us, for the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged swords, and is cutting between soul and spirit. So how many of you ladies would like to know what is from God and what is not from God? That's when the sword comes in. How do I know that job is from God or if it's a distraction from from the enemy, the sword? Uh, Pastor Chantel, on the the 16th of March, when we do the singles night, she's going to share for a couple of moments on 
here comes the pretender, which is the enemy will send people your way that look like they could be a perfect fit to marry, but it's actually from the devil. He's from the devil, okay? But because he came to church and he looks spiritual, how do you distinguish who is from God and who is not from God? Who is God's plan for me and who is not? So that's when the sword comes into it. So let's go to Ephesians 6, 10 to 19. Pastor Al, can I get some more water, please? He's a good husband. I've trained him very well. <laughs> Is it brand new water? Wow. Thank you. <laughs> the joys of serving at a women's event. Okay. Ephesians 6.10. There we go. Uh, can we go in the TPT version, uh, Philip? If we don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we can take the New King James dude away. There we go. Now, my beloved ones, I have saved these most important truths for lost. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. That doesn't sound like backsliddenness. Supernaturally infused with him. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in you and through you. Put on God's complete set of armor he provided for us so that you'll be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand -hand, hand -hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realm. So you are not fighting your boss you are not fighting your husband. So if you are a woman here and you are maybe married to a man who's not saved, you are not fighting the man. You're fighting the spirit behind the man. So you, you love him, you honor him, you respect him, you pray for him. And in your prayer time, you say, every demon that's hindering my husband from coming to the knowledge of you, we come against it in Jesus' name. Any blindfolds, blinkers, you remove it. You're not fighting the man, you're fighting the spirit. It's keeping him from salvation, okay? But with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion, for they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides so that you are protected as, the, as you confront the slanderer. So what happens is if you are not protected in the armor of God, if you have not been sharpening your sword, when the enemy comes, you are defenseless, and then you are weak, your emotions, and then you have to take a break from church because life is so hard. That's another one here, number one thing I hear often, why people don't come to church, because they're going through stuff, and I'm like, you need to sharpen the sword, and then remember, we are in an army, so we sharpen with each other, iron sharpens iron. Okay, so what happens is if you are defenseless, you've not been spending time with God, you're not in a time of worship, you're not reading the Bible for yourself, you have no armor on you. It's like sending you out in the middle of Israel where they are fighting and you've got no armor, no weapon, no sword, no pepper spray, nothing. You are defenseless, you're going to be taken out one time. And then that's why Christians are defeated. And then for years, I'm still in my wilderness season, year three. I'm still in my wilderness. 40 years, you're still in your wilderness season. Because you've actually, you killed yourself a long time ago in the spirit. You're spiritually dead. You need a revival to bring you back alive again. Does that make sense? Let's continue. Confront the slanderer. For you are destined for all things and to what? Rise victoriously. See, the, unfortunately, and it's so sad what's happening with the world now, is that transgender women or men or people are now coming against real women, saying that they are real women as well. And I saw the most disturbing thing on, on TikTok where this transgender woman, so it obviously was a man that's now a woman, is shouting and fighting with women, women, the women, us women, the original deal, saying that we shouldn't be fighting with them, that they can also have menstrual cycles. 
And I'm sitting there like, Lord. So I went onto this video to hear how is a transgender woman having a menstrual cycle? You need certain equipment for that stuff to happen. And the reason was because once a month I also cry. I'm sitting, I'm like, there are no words for what's happening in this world. So because once a month you cried, that is not a menstrual cycle. There is a lot more science and biological things that happen. So as women, we are allowing the spirit to come and take your own identity from us. When your little girl is a little girl, that is a girl. You are a girl, girl, girl. You got the equipment for a girl. Don't let the world tell you. you, Like there's even a new term. Apparently, we're not even called women anymore. You know what our name is now? Cis woman. C I uh, no 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 not cis like cis no, it's C I S. It's like a different class where we're not technically. I don't even I don't even know how to explain it to you. So now it's a transgender woman and a cis woman, not a natural God designed, fully biological DNA woman. So as women, we are lying down and allowing this to happen in the world, allowing our children to tell them, you're a boy, you're a girl, you're a cat, you're a wolf. You know, uh, uh, was it you or Pastor Chantel? Pastor Chantel, there's a new thing coming out now. Transabled. I identify as disabled. So this guy cut off his leg because he's disabled. Another woman identified as blind. So she poured drain bleach in her eyes so she can be blind. This is the world It's going down the tube, guys. (laughs) So we are fighting against this thing. Another thing, what we're praying against in the spiritual realm, the enemy doesn't want people to come to church, don't want you in prayer meetings, don't want you in ladies' meetings. So he makes everything else more important, makes a distraction. There's like a spiritual barrier that people just can't seem to. Have you noticed how many invite people to church all the time? Do they come? Not that anything's wrong, it's just they just there's a spiritual force that's just keeping them from the presence of God. Then when you decide I want to now spend time with the Lord, then that new Grey's anatomy just came out right there. You're like, after the season, after the season, y'all. You watch a whole season in one night and you forgot to pray. So there's always a spiritual force to keep you away from the things of God. There will always be a distraction to keep you away. Something will always come up more important more needed, that'll keep you. It's a spirit you're fighting, not the person. So when you invite your friend to church, you're not fighting the poor guy. It's a spirit behind the person that's holding them back. No, no, don't go. No, 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 don't. Oh, man, church, you are the church, buddy. You don't have to be in church because you are the church. No, that's a lie. How can you be the church if you're not in church? It's like spiritual maths. You know what I mean? It's things that are keeping you away from the things of God. Let's continue. Because of this, you must wear the full armor that God provides that you'll be protected and confront. So there's, a, there's actually a place where you have to confront the enemy yourself. It's not my job to fight your mother-in-law's spirit for you. You have to fight it yourself. You have to do it. So uh, to strengthen you, you will rise victorious. Put on the truth as belt to strengthen you as you stand in triumph. Put on holiness as a protective armor that covers your heart. Take up faith as you wrap around shield, for it is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance, like a helmet to protect your thoughts from lies. So if you don't have a helmet on, the enemy's going to just keep on showing dots at you. You're not worthy. You're not wanted. You're a bad leader. You're a bad children's teacher. You're a bad mother. You're a bad pastor. Look at you. You're such a useless Christian. It's because you didn't have the armor on. See, the thing is, if I know who I am, it doesn't matter what people say. They can come at me at all directions. I'll just sit there. That's why when Pastor Chantal said, have you become harder? No, no, no. I've just got my helmet on. So things don't affect me like they used to because I don't let it affect me like it used to. That's how simple it is. You know, this church, we, were, uh, we went through a season when we first started. We were called a hyper grace church. Then we were called a super law church. This is from the reputation from what people are saying. Then we were called a kundalani. I don't even church. I don't know what that means. This is my favorite one, that we were a Nigerian church, a white Nigerian church. That I thought was quite funny. I was like, really? 
But if you know who you are and who you called and what you called to be, none of that mattered. We all had a good laugh. We're like, yes, how can you be a hyper grace church and a Lord church and now we're a Nike church? I mean, how does that even work? But when you know what God has called you to be, you can still come and do whatever God has called you. That stuff doesn't affect you. You can sleep peacefully at night knowing that none of that matters. What does God matter? Because he's seen my heart at the end of the day. Let's continue. And take up the mighty razor-sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. Yo, that's a lot of sharpening razor. I mean, my husband uses, what's that blade you use for the menorah blade? Have you seen that blade? It is such a sharp blade that he needs it because he's got a very thick beard. So normal razors don't work. But that thing is so sharp. Like he always says, be careful, don't touch it, be careful. Because if, even if you just do that, you bleed, literally. The one time I was cleaning his cupboard and I just touched it and I was like bleeding for days and, you know, having to wrap it. That's how sharp it is, just a little blade. Can you imagine if you actually have that same with your sword the Lord has given you? Can you imagine what heads you can chop off with that thing? You know what I mean? So when, you're, when something attacks you, you just like, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. did you know the origin, the, the history of soccer? Have you guys actually Googled it for yourself? Originally, soccer, which started many, 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 many years ago, originally started when there was a war and heads were chopped off in war. They would use the head, are you guys seeing where this is going, and play with the head, and it eventually turned into the game of soccer. So we're going to have soccer outside later for the ladies. But not chopped heads, just the ones of the enemy. The heads will be rolling. But that's how soccer started. So can you imagine, you are playing with the head of your enemy. Yeah, how nice will that be? So when you get vindicated and the Lord comes through, heads will be rolling, guys. That's a new shirt for heads will be rolling, but just make it decent, not like blood. (laughs) Heads be rolling, join us at St. (laughs) Juan's. But that is where soccer came from. So if you look in the spiritual realm, not now, please don't come to church with your mother and I... (laughs) I have completed the task, please. I'm going to ask you to call Khrundakis and call the special police for you. But in the spiritual realm, what you are capable of when you actually have your sword. So when drugs tries to come into your kid's life, you've got your sword sharp and you can cut that spirit of drugs off before it even hits your child. The uh, fornication, if you see your daughter's going boyfriend's, yeah, cut that, not the boyfriend's head, cut that spirit off of their head that they remain pure, they remain holy. If that little secretary is trying to flirt with your husband, okay, maybe that's when you do actually take a physical sword. And you just go. <laughs> so one day, go visit your husband and just on her table, hello, click, click, click. You just, <laughs> I have a natural sword and a spiritual sword, Susan, you know. <laughs> if your name is Susan, I'm sorry, Okay. But you have a sword to take authority. So no adultery can come into your marriage. No flirtations. If you have that authority, when depression comes, take out your sword, which is your Bible. Take it up and work it. Use it. It's able, you are able to cut off so many heads. When you're starting to feel insecure, I feel, and ladies, I know we go with this, I feel so fat today. I don't feel comfortable with my body. I feel unworthy. My husband would have someone, why are you touching your stomach? You're skinny. You're probably going to have McDonald's and you won't even put on a pound or anything. But we have those moments where we feel, as a wife, how many feel like I'm not pretty enough for my husband? Maybe, and you feel like I could be prettier. No, that's just a lie of the enemy. He married you, didn't he? He loves you. The most beautiful part of marriage is when your husband sees those scars and he knows that you brought life with those scars. And you can blackmail him. No, I'm joking. <laughs> remember these scars, baby. If I say take out the trash, remember, remember the scars. But those are signs that you brought life. And you've got a world that's telling girls they have to be skinny, they have to be this size or no size, minus three size. That is a lie from the enemy. A complete lie. So if you know who you are, it doesn't matter how you might feel on the natural. God still loves you. Your husband loves you and you're beautiful doesn't matter. Like, I also wake up, and I don't look like this when I wake up. This takes work. A lot of work, okay? 
<laughs> I always tell the single ladies, when you go on your first date, make sure you go swimming. Let him see you first so all the makeup can come off so he knows the real you before he marries you. No, I'm joking. You are beautiful, but how do you come against it? Go read Proverbs 31. Put it in your mind how worthy you are, how welcome you are, that he loves you so much, that you, he loves every part of you, that you were thought of before you even conceived, before your daddy even put a ring on it. God already saw you. He knew you. He loved you. He still does love you. So it doesn't matter if Susan is a whatever size bra, and doesn't matter how tight those jeans are. God put you as his wife. You are designed to protect his heart. That's what the sword is for. So as women, I mean, the men don't quite see this, but we can see when a chick is flirting with our men, right? There's just something you can like, mm. the man can be clueless because they are sometimes are, but you are there. <laughs> you are there to protect his heart. So you are the one that's stepping on toes. No, you're sitting there too long, Susan. Come now. Move away, girl. You know, you protect his heart at his workplace. When he goes to work in the morning and you've dropped off the kids, whatever, Lord, I pray for my husband today. When he goes to work, I thank you, Lord, that you plead the blood of Jesus over him, that there's favor on him. I thank you, Lord, that the boss is seeing something new on him, going to promote him. Every Jezebel in that place, every Susan in that place, we come against her. She will not touch my marriage. She will not touch my husband. Everything that his hands touch, he will prosper in Jesus' name. That's how you pray, whether he's saved or not. Because suddenly you've put a wrap around around him that when he's at work, when he's wherever he is with the boys, he's wrapped, he's protected. Whether he's saved or not, he's already protected because he's got a wife that's fighting for him back at home. Amen. That's the sword. Let's continue with the mighty razor sword of the spoken word. So you have to what the word? Speak the word. Have you noticed if you've got a thought in your mind and you speak out loud, the thought disappears. Like, I can do an experiment on you. Everyone had to close your eyes and see a pink elephant. If I just say, okay, now say your name, the pink elephant disappears, because now you're distracted from what was here, the spoken word. You need to speak the word when things happen. Next point, let me just take a... Pray what? Passively. No, no, passive. It's passively, ladies. Read. Passively. Quietly, sometimes, every now and again, when the poo hits the fan, then I pray. No, 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 no. Read. Passionately, in the Spirit, as you what? Constantly intercede with every form of prayer at what time? Sometimes. All times. Pray the blessings of God upon all His believers. And pray also that God's revelation would be released through me through you and preach the wonderful mystery of, okay, I need to hurry up, mystery of the hope-filled gospel. I haven't even hit my point yet. 1 Timothy 6.12, but then I'm going to, you go, girl. Okay, 1 Timothy 6.12, TPT. I'm going to read it while Philip gets it. So fight with faith for the winner's prize. Lay your hands upon the extern, eternal life to which you're called, about which you've made the confession between a multitude of witnesses. Have you noticed when you get married, you have what? Witnesses. When you say yes to the Lord, there are witnesses watching you. They're also watching you to see how you're walking. If you're going to walk, talk the talk, you better walk the walk. What is, babe, you say, um, don't cash checks that your body, don't speak checks that you, anyway that you can't cash, okay? Don't talk something that you can't do, okay? So what the point that I want to speak about now is the story of Deborah. Have you ever gone through Deborah in the Bible? Let's go through that a little bit. The story of Deborah in the Bible shows us that the Lord calls ordinary people to do extraordinary things. They can only be accomplished through the Spirit. The Bible study of Judges 4 and 5 explores what we can learn about Deborah, about calling and the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to read through everything. You need to go... Uh, Judges 4 and 5. But I'm just going to read just a little bit of an introduction. Introduction to Deborah. The story of Deborah is in Judges 4 and 5, begins like many of the stories in the book of Egypt, in the book of Judges, where the Israelites have once again sinned against the Lord, uh, and they sold out to the king, the king at that time. This went on for 20 years until the Israelites eventually cried out to the Lord for help. 
At that time, Deborah was leading Israel as a judge. So she was quite high up as a judge in Israel. She then sent for Barak, who was a commander in Israel's army, and told them to go and fight Jabin's army and lead by Caesarea. Now this lead army guy said to her, I will only go if Deborah comes with me. So he's saying, I'll only go to war if you come with me and you lead with me, basically. Deborah agreed, but told Barak that the honor will not go to him because, listen, ladies, the honor will not go to him because if I'm going to war, the Lord will deliver into the hands of a woman. The Bible, I'll find the verse, I'm just doing a paraphrase. She says, if you want me to come with you, the honor and the glory is not going to go to you and your army, but it's going to come to me, the woman. The victory will be to the hands of the woman. When Barak's army advances, the Lord routes Caesarea's army, which was the other one, and Caesarea flees on foot. Then they go to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, because there was an alliance between King Jabin uh, and Herban's family. Jael invited them in and served him refreshments. So this, this woman invited the enemy in for refreshments, but wait. Caesarea was so exhausted and he fell asleep, and Jael took a hammer and pounded a tent head pig into his temple, killing him. That was kind of sneaky. Come, come, I've got Jacob's coffee and, and fat cook. Come, come. While he sleeps, bah, in the head, gets rid of the enemy one time. Ladies, you know what you're capable of? You don't let the enemy take advantage of you. you we need to wake up. The Israelites fought against the king Jabon until they destroyed him. And Deborah and Barak's song of praise and Israel had peace for 40 years. Now let's dig a little bit deeper before this happens now. Deborah was a very busy woman. How many of you are busy women? Okay, you guys are not so busy, praise God. Okay. Judges 4 5 says that she held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the country. And the Israelites went up to have her, their disputes decided. Deborah was a woman of great wisdom, revelation, and discernment. Okay? She also had the prophetic gift, knowing the times and seasons of the Lord, and she clearly heard the voice of God. How many of you would love that anointing? That's what it's all about. Then in Deborah's, then in Deborah's, in Judges 5.12, can we go there, Philippe? Judges 5.12, the New King James Version. I want to see if they have the same verse there. Judges 5.12. And then I'm almost done. Judges 5.12. There we go. Now, she is talking to herself here. Deborah is speaking to herself. She's singing to herself. Wake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of that place. So she's telling herself to wake up. So how many of you need to wake up? Oh, wake up, wake up, Marzan. Go and do what God has called you to do. Wake up, wake up, Pastor Rosie. Go and do what God has called you to do. Wake yourself up. She's waking herself up here. She's telling herself, I need to wake up. Break out in song and go and take your captive, captive, captives. So the other verse says, taking your captives, captive. How cool is that? That you take the enemy captive. So you've got like your own prison in your, in your own house where you keep the enemy there. He can't come anywhere else. You keep him captive. And now she was saying to wake up to a new revelation and dimension of her calling. The Lord was telling her to be alert and pay attention as he was about to move in an extraordinary way. Then in Judges 5, 7, it says, Villages in Israel were not felt, would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose. The army did not fight until Deborah said, I need to rise up and take control. So how many of you or your families are waiting for you to catch a wake up and go and do what God has called you to do? They're waiting for you. Your kid is not going to do what they call to do until you do what you call to do. If you don't fight certain things in your life, your kid is going to have to fight certain things in their lives. You have to fight. So your family is saying, we will not fight until my mom wakes up. 
until my dad wakes up, until my family, until the church wakes up. Why will Jesus come? The church is not even ready. The church is in a disgrace. Have you seen what's out there? Pastor, I was sharing something with me last night. Uh, uh, there's a place uh, somewhere over, uh, in Joburg, somewhere, you, you remember you told me, where this church wanted to rent a building somewhere in Johannesburg. And they were renting from a Muslim man, if I'm not mistaken. And the Muslim owner came to one of the pastors that we know and said, are you aware of what's happening with this church over the weekend? And the owner's like, well, no, they, they've taken the building on as a church. He says, but that's not what's happening here. The pastors are bringing women in and they're sleeping with them during the services. Right here in Joburg, I don't want to give more details, but it's happening. We heard about this this week. That this Muslim man has said to the pastor that we know, are you one of these Christians? Jesus cannot come in the world that the state is in right now. Last night I said at the prayer meeting that the Bible said, Jesus says that when I return, it will be as the days of Noah. Have you done research of the population of the earth when the days, when the flood happened? Have you ever done that research before? Estimated between 240 million and 4 billion people were on the earth when the floods came. How many people made it? Eight. And the Bible's saying, when the Lord comes, it will be the days of Noah. That means it could have been just us. That's it. Out of a 7 billion population, only eight people make it. Let's just say 1,000 people. A thousand people are on the earth today. When Jesus comes, how many are going to make it? If it was in the days of Noah, only eight people? Eight people? Out of 240 million people, only eight were saved because of the wickedness that was on the earth. And we've seen it even worse now than what it was back then. And why is this happening? Because the church is sleeping. We want cook and tear on Sundays. We just want to talk about our sin and be hunky-dory and go to dead churches and be in religion when Jesus will pass you guys, not you guys, those guys, by. It's like I had a, the one time I was with Pastor Chantal and I said, when we go into the rapture, who's going to feed my dogs? It was a random thought. I thought, and then I realized, but most of the people around me in my area are all sinners, so someone will take them in. So that'll be fine. But it was a thought that I had because I'm thinking, here I'm thinking, because I had a thought of, they're going to be animals, they're going to be roaming loose and no one's going to take care of them. But then, like the Lord said, there's going to be a lot of people left behind. How sad is that? Just think about it. Let us continue. So Deborah, they would not fight until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose as a mother in Israel. Now, it's not clear whether she had natural children or not, but she was considered the mother in Israel. Now, how many people around you need mommies? There's a lot of broken people, a lot of broken families, no daddies, no mommies. Who is around you that you can actually mommy and waiting for you to stand up and mother them a little bit? Deborah could have legitimately called herself a judge, a prophet, a deliverer, an intercessor, a worshiper, but she chose to call herself a mother. She was a mother in Israel, but also served a mother over Israel. It can be translated both ways. She saw of all of Israel as her children and longed for all of her children, literally and figuratively, to experience peace and security in the presence of God. So here's a woman who took responsibility, said, the whole of Israel is my children, so I will stand up and fight for them. And look at that. That's exactly what she did. Notice the verse says that no one would Israel would fight until she arose. The Israelites were beaten down by 20 years of slavery, and they were too tired and discouraged to fight. They needed someone to inspire them, and the Lord chose Deborah. And the Lord chose Lizel, and the Lord chose Marzan, the Lord chose uh, Corin. That's what the Lord is choosing. But are you going to accept the call upon your life? Because if you look at it, yes, many of you are moms right now. You will always be a mom. You'll always be a mommy even when they are 50 years old. Your mommy season never changes. Your mommy time never. You'll always be a wife. You'll always be a mom. But what else are you called to do that God is going to push you in? Because you're not only just called to be a mom. You're not only just called to be a wife. There's more inside of you that only you can reach certain people because God called you to reach those people. Not, uh, not Marzan, not uh, anyone else. Jeanette, they, God has called you to reach that people. You, Jeanette can't reach the people that you were supposed to reach. So if you don't, like Pastor Al's message this week, don't abandon your post. Part two, I'm excited for tomorrow. 
if you abandon what you're supposed to do, God has to raise up someone else to take your place and cause an interference in the matrix a little bit. So if you don't take up your spot, someone else has to raise up and take your spot. And then you're going to lose your spot in what God called you. Yes, you might make it to heaven, but God's going to say, but you didn't quite do what I asked you to do. So many more people could have been called, could have been healed, delivered if you just stood up and did what you were supposed to do. Amen? So don't be stuck in a season where I can't do more because I'm just here. You are always capable of more. You're not just a mom. You're not just, before you're a mom, before you're a wife, you are a child of God first. If you understand that office, then anything else you can operate and you'll succeed in all offices from there. Amen? They needed someone to inspire them, and the Lord chose Deborah. If she had not been obedient to act on what the Lord had told her to do, nothing would have changed. She used the place of peace, trust, and authority, uh, the place of trust and authority she had been given as a judge to inspire up a whole army to rise up. So she was a worshiping warrior. She found encouragement and strength in worship to be obedient to everything the Lord was asking her to do. If Deborah had played small in her life, she would not have had all the experiences that led her to be used by the Lord to deliver Israel from bondage. So you could be used to deliver someone from their bondage, but because you don't want to step up, that people remain in bondage. So God has put you in your area, in your church, to serve, to be used, to help, to raise people up, to actually go out there and get people. That's why as a church, as St. Ones, we are doing a lot of evangelism this year. We are hitting the streets We've got our ladies' hikes, which we're trying to bring people to come and join us. This is what we're doing because we need to go and reach out more. If the days are dark, we need to shine even light brighter. If she had not listened, what would have happened? So this morning, often we are encouraged, we are discouraged and afraid to step out of our comfort zones. And it becomes and, and become everything that God has called me to be. It is a blessing that the Lord doesn't give us the whole plan for our lives. Ugh, I wish I knew. You know, it would make it easier if I got a memo PDF file of what God wants me to do. But it's not that easy. He only reveals as you move. Have you noticed? Only when you step out, you're like, oh, wait, this is easy. Oh, wait, is that what you're telling me to do? Oh, no, this is where I need to go. Like uh, Morzana is offered to be one of our next teachers at Kingdom Kitties. She's not sure if that's where she's called. She says, I want to just serve. So God's going to say, okay. But because you're stepping out of your, your zone a little bit, now I can maybe use you a little bit more. Now you're becoming more confident. Now you're ministering to the next generation. And as you keep on moving, God starts to do more. But you're only going to move if you step out of your comfort zone. That's how we are a church that believes kicking you out of the nest is a good thing. Because if I just let you sit here and be all gushy-gushy, spoon-feed you, you will never do what God has called you to do. Now I'm not saying many of you are called for this. This is different. The Bible says don't desire this. Get a job. I'm joking, okay? But when you are called, God will provide the calling for you. So some of you are called for the marketplace. Some of you are called to raise children for the next generation. But you're not just to stay in that place. There's still more you can do. Be a mother to someone else. Raise up someone else's children. Let them help, help someone else that are struggling. That is what you're called to do. Maybe it's the waving at the gate. You don't know what someone is going through. And just by you saying, hello, welcome to church, you're like, I feel a little bit more better today. How many of you ever had that moment? Then Pastor Rosie's sitting there, you're the first one they hug, and you feel, oh, hey, hugging ministry, it's there. People need hugs. Uh, Pastor Al, many years ago, he was counseling, a, well, actually not really, many, many years ago, he was dealing with a, a young man who never actually wanted hugs. He was very, you don't hug the guy, you're just like, how's it, whatever. And one time during prayer, Pastor Al went and bear hugged the guy. I mean, like just, and something broke over him that he only hugged people after that. The guy couldn't, you couldn't get away from the guy without him hugging everybody. So everyone plays a part in your ministry, whether it's the youth, which starts with the young people, whether it's home groups, whether it's the hikes, whether it's walking with Pastor Arthur, something has to happen. You're all called to do something. Amen. Step out of your comfort zone. See, the loading dock is loading up people that are ready to go out, eh? Amen. <laughs> It's a blessing that he doesn't give us our whole lives in advance because most of us would not respond if we knew what we were all called to do. If I knew that this is what God was going to call me to do, I would have probably become a pediatrician, a vet, 
whatever. Because I thought, I would not, I'm not capable of doing that. But he doesn't tell you everything. He just wants you to trust him. And then you step out as you go. So, the Lord prepared Deborah in the secret place of her worship, which helped her grow in confidence in hearing God's voice. Her, internet, her intentional connection to God through worship gave her the confidence as she discerned the time when to go to war. Some people are warring around and using their sword, and I'm like, what are you fighting about? Put down your sword and just go into a time of worship. Spend time with them. God will tell you when it's time to war against certain things in your life, in your family, whatever the case might be. Some people are in spiritual warfare all the time, but you're not doing anything for the Lord. So why would the enemy attack you if you're not doing anything? If, he, if you've just been complacent and chilling, he, you are exactly where he wants you to be. The minute you start walking and moving and doing things, that's when the enemy comes under attack, tries to attack, and that's when you need to stand f- firm, and that's when you use your, your sword. The Lord will do the same with us. As we go deeper in relationship with God, God will guide us to clarity around the call for our season for the kingdom work. God can use many ways to confirm it to us over and over again. As Christ followers and as daughters, we are embarking on an exciting journey of serving the Lord here on earth. That is what we're called for. As women, we are called for war. God didn't choose the biggest dude out there with CrossFit and military experience. No, he chose a woman. And she still even had the boldness to say that they'll be delivered into a woman's hands. I like that a lot. That the enemy gets delivered into my hands. A woman, where many people are saying women are not capable, they can't preach, you must just sit in the kitchen, don't do nothing. Here God is saying, you used a woman. Okay? Ladies, I'm telling you, buy your boots for winter and we can take on. So let me just pray with you, then we'll have a time of fellowship. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you raise up Deborahs in this generation, that we can go out and war for our children, our family, our ministries, our callings, our workplaces. Thank you, Lord, that we have a spirit of endurance, that will not lay down when things get tough, will not backslide when storms hit, but instead we'll remain confident in what you have called us to do, in who we are as a child of God, that we will serve you all heartedly, fully, fully surrender, that we can take up our sword, and we'll never put our sword down, even when situations get tough. So we thank you, Lord, that in this generation and in this church, you are raising up Deborahs that will say, Lord, send me to go fight. Send me, Lord, put me in the front lines so I can fight for my generation, fight for what the Lord has put in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'll give you your sword back now. now. Uh, Wait, before you switch off. So next week, Saturday, we are going on our hike. But it's an over 60s hike. So, <laughs> sorry, the ladies requested, a, the older ladies requested a knee friendly hike. So, there's no climbing up hills or anything. It's a gentle walk. Um, we will advertise over the week. We meet at church and we're going to go together. We're going to walk and pray and we're going to enjoy it. It's a nature reserve. So, you're going to see zebras and bucks and tigers and all of that wonderful stuff. Because, you know, the tiger's all over the place recently, so you never know what you're going to find. So if you want, the entrance is for free. There's an entrance free. Uh, you don't have to pay for entrance. So we'll put more information on Facebook um, about meeting times, what you need. And then we'll all drive. We'll convoy together. We're going to clip review something, something. Uh, uh, internet is planning it. So please, ladies, join us for a time of walking and fellowship. And sunburn. Praise the Lord. So come and have some fellowship. We're going to have some coffee. If you need to leave, thank you for joining. And we'll see you all tomorrow for church. Don't put down. Don't abandon your post tomorrow morning. Can't wait. Thank you. Enjoy your coffee.